Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Bible in One Year with the Preacher's Husband. Today we're going through 1 Kings chapter 15 verses 1 through 24 and 2 Chronicles 13 through 16. So that's chapter 13 through chapter 16. That's a chunk of it. Tomorrow we're going through 1 Kings chapter 15 verses 25 all the way through chapter 16 verse 34 and also 2 Chronicles chapter 17. So, chapter 15 of First Kings starts out talking about Judah's king Abijah. Abijah, king of Judah, the good king who turned to the dark side. <laughs> no, he wasn't a Sith Lord, but if we look at him through the perspective of First Kings chapter 15, there is nothing good about this dude. According to this, but later on we're going to find out in Second Chronicles that there was actually some good about him. He was a good king. It says he turned to the dark side, but there's not a lot of defining moments that describe that in the Bible. Um, it just starts out by basically saying that he had all of the sins of his father. He walked in his footsteps and um, he was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God, as his ancestor David had been. So, in short, Abijam was bad, just like his father, with a typical negative comparison to David in this section. And then we get into Judah's king Asa. And Asa has a few things about, about him here. Um, essentially, he was the... He was the... The king that started a revival. He was the one that they started talking about as a positive king, as a good king. He had a very good start. He served many years for the Lord. Uh, but he also failed to seek the trust of God in his later years. But most of his life he did good. But he started some really good stuff. First he started this religious revival that kind of... Um, it just kind of kicked things off. He got rid of all of the pagan... Um, idols and all the idol worship and he got rid of the queen mother and got her out of the picture because she was a stumbling block to faith in God essentially is what she was and that was part of the cleansing process that he started in the kingdom and that was removing her bad influence of her leading people to worship these idols as well so Later on in his life, in verse 16 and 17, we see where he went to war with um, King Basha. And King Basha apparently penetrated Benjaminite territory and began building a fortress there at Ramah, which was only about six miles north of Jerusalem. And that could have cut off all of the trade going up and down that road. This was actually such a serious threat that Asa purchased an alliance with the Arameans of Damascus. And this is where the chronicler in Chronicles that we're going to read about rebukes Asa for not trusting in the Lord instead of hiring an outside army to help him. So we're going to jump into Second Chronicles chapter 13. And we're going to start out here with Abijah. And Abijah, he reigned for three years in Jerusalem. There was a war between Abijah and Jeroboam. And that's what you see on your screen here. Is essentially their battle where that happened, their war. Um, Abijah had 400,000 for Judah. And Jeroboam had 800,000 fit young men for battle. And Abijah stood there on the mountain. And then he talks... There's a, some, some narrative here as um, he basically says, but as for us, the Lord is our God and we have not abandoned him. So he is calling on God to help him here and God does. Now Jeroboam had sent an ambush during this time around to the back side of Abijah's position. So they were in front of Judah and they had an ambush behind them as well. So Judah turned and they realized what was happening. So that's when they really just cried out to the Lord. Lord God help us here. Only you're the only one that can help us um, do this. So they cried out and the priests started blowing their trumpets and the men of Judah raised their battle cry. And when they did, they raised that battle cry. God routed Jeroboam and all of Israel before Abijah and Judah. 
So the Israelites started fleeing. They started running back, trying to get away. And Abijah and his people struck them with a mighty blow. And 500,000 Israelites were killed during that war. That is a ton of folks. Tons of folks, I say. Tons. So we get into chapter 14 of Second Chronicles. And we're talking about King Asa here. Now, King Asa, in light of, if you look back at Abijah's um, life, you basically only see this one positive event where he looked to God and was successful. Everything else apparently was negative, according to the chronicler. And, and at best, he received a neutral death notice. But then when um, Asa showed up, he was the third king of Judah. He was Abijah's son, and he was devoted to God, but he closed himself off for, from God there towards the end of his life. Not exactly sure why, but he does. In verses, um, starting in verse 8, he was attacked by the Cushites. So he had an army of about 300,000 from Judah and 280,000 from Benjamin. So that's a total of 580,000 dudes. That's a lot. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of troops. That was way more than Abijah had. Asa had a much bigger army. Unfortunately for him, Zerah the Cushite attacked him with a million men plus 300 chariots. So instead of concealing himself behind his newly built fortifications that he had built, Asa and his smaller army marched out to confront Zerah in the vicinity of, in the vicinity of Merashah, a town in the western Judah. And when he did, Asa cried out to the Lord. And here's what he said. He said, Lord, there is no one besides you to help the mighty. And those without strength help us, Lord our God, for we depend on you. And in your name, we have come against the large army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let a mere mortal hinder you. So the Lord routed the Cushites before Asa. And before Judah and the Cushites fled, Asa and the people, they pursued him until he, there were no more survivors. Then they attacked all the cities that were around them and they plundered them since there was a great deal of plunder in them. And then that, after that Cushite invasion and Asa was able to be victorious, that's when the revival started happening. Um, that's when Asa kicked out the mama and started... Um, the grandma, excuse me, and chopped down all of the obscene images and all of the pillars that were built to gods and all of the, got rid of all of the idols. And once he did that, there was no war until the 35th year of his reign when him, King Asa, and King Basha from Israel went to war. So again, civil war rages on. Asa's, Asa decided that this was his 36th year of being the king and Basha comes to go to war with him and essentially comes south, starts fortifying this area to try to cut off the trade route. Well, Asa goes to Aram, Aram's king Ben-Hadad who lived in Damascus and said, there's this treaty between me and you, you know. I need you to go break your treaty with Israel and King Basha so that he will withdraw from me. So once he does that, it happens essentially. And this um, seer who was named Hanani came to the king of King Asa of Judah and said, because you depended on the king of Aaron and have not depended on, on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped from you. Were not the Cushites and Libyans a vast army with many chariots and horsemen? He's referring back to his previous war where um, God had delivered them out of that those million men that had attacked. When you depend on the Lord, he handed them over to you, and he did. But he says, you've been foolish because you've asked this guy to come and do what you should have basically asked God to help you with instead. So that made Asa super mad. He got enraged with the seer. He put him in prison. And then from that point on, Asa started mistreating the people that were around him. And he kind of started to turn bad. He even 
um, he got a disease in his foot that spread and even when his even in his disease he did not seek the Lord from that point on but only physicians and he died in the 41st year of his reign now we've read all about all this stuff and about all of these civil wars I'll tell you when I think of civil war and I think of some of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War, like what happened here with Abijah and and um, Jeroboam. I think about the Battle of Gettysburg. I think about how that was the largest number of casualties in the Civil War, with over 51,000 Americans dying at the Battle of Gettysburg between July 1st and July 3rd. Of 1863 and of course you can't think about Gettysburg without thinking about a Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address of course either but I challenge you look up the Gettysburg Address the four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. And it goes on, and I challenge you to look it up. Just Google it and read it because we're having some trouble in our nation right now. I don't think it's going to lead to civil war, but there's talk. And I would just say it's probably not the best route to go. We've been there, we've done that, we've got the t-shirt. And I don't want another one between you and me. <laughs> so, God bless you. I hope this has touched you. If it has, click the like button and the subscribe button. And, of course, click the little jingle bell so you get notified the next time I upload a video, which will be tomorrow for another episode of the Bible in one year with the preacher's husband. We'll see you then.